here and welcome back to highintensitybusiness.com, the podcast where we discuss high intensity strength training and provide you with the tools, the tactics, and strategies to help you grow your strength training business. This is episode 335. And today's topic is we focused on a new book. The book is called Deep Fitness, the mindful science-based strength training method to transform your well-being in just 30 minutes per week. Um, I have the authors of that book on the podcast. Uh, Philip Shepard and Andre Yekovenko, who has been a guest a long, long time ago. Just a couple of points about the book. This will get you really excited. Doug McGuff wrote the foreword, which is very flattering. Dr. Wayne Westcott said that it had the most comprehensive chapter on the health benefits of strength training he had ever read. And Dr. James Fisher said this could be the most important book you can read. That's quite a statement right there. Welcome, gents, to the podcast. Great to have you. It's great to be here, Lawrence. Thank you. So really excited for this book. I think it's definitely filling a need in health and fitness in general. But I think there's also, as I was saying to both of you before we got started, there's definitely a a cohort, a large cohort of people in high intensity training who really struggle to get to muscle failure. And so any approaches or ways that they can leverage to make their workouts more productive, more mindful, um, I think is really valuable. So I'm excited to learn more about this. But before we get into the book, I think it'd be good to understand how this book came about and how you guys met. So do you want to, uh, I don't know, Andre, do you want to start off with that and we'll go from there? Yeah. Um, so as you know, from the the previous podcast podcast we did a few years ago, and now we talked a bit about the mindful approach that I was trying to uh, implement and was like, experimenting with. And then I came across this guy who became my co-author and a dear friend. And, and frankly, from so many different perspectives, you know, mindfulness um, and general, the, this is, I wouldn't be able to write book, book of this caliber with anybody else in the world. So, um, you know, at some point when I came across Philip's work, I invited him for a workout. He loved it. I loved his work and we sort of been collaborating between, you know, our approaches, our um, areas of expertise and eventually came to, to this book, writing this book together where uh, there's a whole chapter where Philip talks about practical, mindful, you know, step-by-step approach uh, and, and the benefit of that approach, not only you will find literally joy rather than suffering this workout, but also you're going to go longer with your time under load. So hence produce more potent stimulus and arguably, you know, get somewhat better results. So maybe Philip can, um, you know, add a little bit more to this story. Um, yeah. From my perspective, yeah, sure. I got a, I got an email. Um, hi, my name is Andre. I have a gym in Toronto and we have a mutual friend who, who suggested I reach out to you. Um, and so I went in, yeah, I, honestly, in my life, I've never been drawn to gyms. And I walked into Andre's gym. And of course, it was it was unlike any gym I've been in. It, it was quiet and there were no video screens and no loud music and no mirrors and just these machines. And, and he took me through the workout. And as he said, I loved it. I was more alive during that workout than I'd been for weeks, you know, so it's like this cleanse. It's like this joy as Andre talks about it. And, and we spent, um, well over two years sharing with each other. So Andre would, would share the science, um, behind the workout and, and how it affects, you know, the biochemistry of the body. And, and I shared my work with Andre and he took a couple of workshops and did a facilitator's training with me. And, you know, it's like this dovetailing of our, of our work. So the, the book, um, really introduces this modality MSTF or mindful strength training to failure that, that is, a is a marriage, you know, and it's not just that mindfulness offers something to strength training, that slow mindful practice allows me to be more embodied and more present um, 
in a specific way than any other practice I've come up with. And could you just go on to talk about the embodied present process that you founded as well? Because that's, I think it's probably a natural path to talk about that now as well. Yeah. So, so, um, Andre comes from the, the hit modality and my modality is one I developed, um, the embodied present process. And, you know, I've, I, I've written two books and, and what I, what I teach, um, comes out of that. Uh, and what the books, I mean, the books are my take on our cultural disembodiment. Um, and we, 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 we're immersed in it. We, we habituate to it. We take it for granted. We're taught that you can think more clearly. You know, if you, if you stifle all that energy below the neck and, and take charge with the head, uh, I mean, that's what our school system does. You know, if your body's energy isn't controlled, you get into trouble. In my day, you actually got the strap. Um, and meanwhile, you're taught to fill your head with, with these ideas and you're rewarded if you do. And we, we come to believe that we can think more clearly with this fragmented portion of our intelligence in the head than we can with the whole of our being. So, um, I, I learned largely from other cultures what it means to think with the whole of your being. And there is a coherence and a clarity and a harmony to that and that. So I think, you know, our idea of mindfulness is limited and the effectiveness of mindfulness is limited if we understand the mind to be just the intelligence in the head. When you understand that mind suffuses every cell in your body, then mindfulness really acquires the potency that that it deserves. And I mean, I know it's probably quite complex and longer than you could probably prescribe on a podcast where we obviously got lots of things to talk about, but how does one actually become more aware of that sort of mind-body connection and become more present and really start to embody this this practice and what are is it is is it is it are you able to ask that with with a set of i don't know uh practices that someone needs to do um or or i don't know like a a, is there a formula for this like how does it work how do you get good at it if that's even an end point yeah no no it's uh, really good questions um i think i think the beginning the first step comes with a recognition of how thoroughly our bodies have been desensitized to the present, to the world around us. Um, it, it, you know, it happens systematically. It's embedded in our language, our architecture, our hierarchies. I mean, every hierarchy from a church bake sale to national government has as its leader the head of that organization. It's, it's just totally natural to us. We're, 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 we're um, indoctrinated in this idea that to be a successful human being is to have a good head on your shoulders and to take charge of the body in this top-down manner. And so how to begin, you know, to come back to the body, I think you first need to recognize in how many ways We've been indoctrinated against that. It helps to understand that historically, and I mean, way back to the Neolithic Revolution, we experienced our thinking in the belly. And it's only as we took charge and began to control the world around us with agriculture and domesticated animals and permanent settlements that that center of thinking began to rise through the body and by Plato's day, you can see clearly it's in the head, and our living has become more and more abstract since that. So when you when you understand, oh, we used to experience our thinking in the body, that gives us sort of the, the 
the hope, the affirmation that, that there's value there. And the body processes a billion times more information than we can be consciously aware of. And so to, to in effect, surrender to the body and find that attuned intelligence um, requires the breath. So every, you know, the body is fluid. We're 65% water. Every breath is a wave that travels through the body. But anywhere that the body's been desensitized, there is tension. And that tension inhibits the breath wave. So, you know, as a first simple, concrete, tangible step, allow the breath into your body. And anywhere you're not feeling the breath, let the breath wave be like a wave on the beach. And the breath wave moves into that consolidation. It's like, a, it's like the effect that waves have on a sand castle as the tide is coming in. And bit by bit, the breath wave dissolves that consolidation. And at a certain point, you feel the breath wave from the soles of your feet to the top of your head to your fingertips. And you are reclaiming the body's sensitivity to the world, and then to understand that the body, its intelligence, works most acutely when the body is understood as a resonator. So it's like the body is like a singing bowl, and it there is there is no there's nothing that happens in the universe that in some way doesn't pass through the body. So either you resonate to what is happening around you, you feel the present in that way, or the body is dulled to it. So to understand emptiness as a value rather than a liability is, a, is also a big first step. I'm really starting to understand now how high intensity training really dovetails with this concept because it's waking up the body like nothing else that I've ever experienced, except maybe plunging into an ice cold sea, you know, sort of in December in, in Galway here in Ireland, which also wakes you up pretty, pretty dramatically. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because as I was listening to you, I was thinking there's so many times after a workout where I just feel so inspired. And I've done some of the most creative work, um, mostly written work, blog posts, that kind of thing, straight after a workout, immediately afterwards. Even though a lot of people will say, I, I know there's one colleague I, I know who calls it workout brain, like straight after a workout, she can't, she can't think, you know, she's not as, she's got a different, different kind of um, experience to me. But for me, I don't know, maybe I'm being unfair. Maybe she's she can do certain things. She's competent at certain things straight after a workout. Maybe not. It's maybe not like a blanket thing. But for me, it's it's the it's the opposite. It's I I feel inspired. I feel like I've got you know some something to. I've, I've got to take that energy and use it right then. You know. Um, yeah. Can so I, no, just, I resonate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Go yeah, ahead. Can I just say that 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 um, you are? Yeah. I mean that emptiness. You are clearing out you get taking all the i mean the week's frustration the week's everything yeah. all this energy is rallied and put to use and there is this cleansing and for me the most exquisite part of the workout is i've just finished the leg press and i am emptied i am in this state of pure being and there is such bliss and i i linger there andre Andre encourages me to let's go to the next machine and 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 or just just because he's got another client, Philip. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, there's that, too, there's that too. But also, you know, the cardio benefit, you know, is is, is yeah. increased. Um, but but I'm I'm, it's that bliss that I most look forward to. Yeah, I love can that. I just uh, can I add something of, to here? Of course, of course. For those of us who still live in the head. <laughs> Essentially, um, you know, presence, it's something as Philip would say, it's a flow. It's, it's changing from second moment to moment, moment to moment. So it's not an abstract constant, right? And our brain, 
our head that, that abstract intelligence is very good and abstracts is labeling you know events and objects and situations right so taking that out of its fluidity and, and creating a label around it and if you want to be present so the presence is not an abstract is that just constantly changing flow that happening right now at this moment from you know second to second second to second and you can feel it you can experience it through your body the body is kind of your vessel of experiencing that flow because if you start thinking too much from the head that's it you're back in your head you're back in those abstract which is not present which is something you plan for future went and so on and so forth in relation to this workout you know yeah you can get this practices and you can go for a you know walk in a forest and you know try to be very you know sadly try to feel your body and just f- feel the surrounding can get a sense of presence but with this training what we practice and you practice in your place when we move slowly just allow just focus on the experience just feel the body feel the muscle and kind of you put your awareness on those sensations and they change it from second to second. And next thing you know, you're approaching failure, but there's a smile in your face because you kind of, you took break from those abstract realities from that supervisor we have in the head, that that vigilance that keeps us safe. And you now just experiencing being, and you really, when you focus on tuning into those sensations, um, it feels very liberating than any, anything else. You don't mind that intensity. And so that's kind of a little like a side note <laughs> because I still live in my head. You know, sometimes I do feel the work, I kind of get a but sort of just to, you know, lay person to understand how it works. And you mentioned something about jumping into the cold water. So there was this time, I remember when you said it a couple of years ago, maybe more, it was definitely before COVID. I asked Philip to spend a couple of days with me and so I can just focus on doing his practices and, you know, build that sensitivity, that neurology to experiencing the world from the belly, as uh, he talks about. And I thought, oh, it's a great idea. I'm going to go stay at his house. He lives on this beautiful island out 10 minutes from downtown Toronto, which is like a cottage country, but yet within 10 minutes, ferry ride, and you're busiest, you know, financial core in, in Canada. And so at, when I was there, Philip said, let's go for a dip in the lake. And that's mid-April, Canada. Right? It's pretty cold. So I know if I'm going to do that, go there and be in my head, I will suffer, right? Because there is this judgment comes in. No, this is too cold and I would rather be somewhere else. So instead, I dedicated to kind of and what he teaches, you can literally take that awareness, you can feel it moving around your head, and you can also feel it moving around your body. So I, as we walk into the beach, I did my best trying to dro- drop that awareness into my belly. I walk into the lake, and I'm standing there, you know, maybe uh, chin high in the water, and I'm noticing how my body is shivering, is moving, right? But at the same time, I kept my awareness in the belly. There was like zero suffering. There was actually joy. Like I, I was enjoying that because I kind of became very neutral to those sensations, those experiences, it didn't matter how intense they were. And I knew if the moment I lose that connection to my belly, I'm going to go back to my head, I'm going to suffer again. And, and I took that experience into, you know, when coaching clients, and this is what we are essentially, when you're in that state, um, it could be, you know, cold water, it could be a leg press. If you learn how to, focus on that experience and, you know, lower your awareness kind of into your body, out of your head, then you take the suffering away from, and you just become neutral to those experiences. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to get into that more. In fact, it might be a good time to get into that right now. So one of the things you, you sent me, Andre, as you said, to experience hit trainee or a hit coach is to understand that you can find a deep sense of freedom and joy during these workouts as opposed to doing it in a suffering state. Now, it's funny because the first thing I thought of when I read that was my friend Nigel Roundtree, who will probably listen to this podcast, who trains clients in Cavern in Ireland, which is a couple of hours away from us. He came down to visit, and it's the first time he'd used a MedEx leg press. And I don't think I've ever had someone on their fifth you know, super slow rep on a MedEx leg press say when they're in the bottom 
oh, this is such a lovely resistance curve because he's so in love with machines that he really appreciates the the curves and the the, the engineering. But obviously, most people in Rep Five by that point hate me, right? Um, and he was just in in I guess he was in a kind of bliss, and he, he was really enjoying the moment. Um, but he is an exception in my experience, and I'm I'm curious. I know you've touched on this a little bit already, guys, and maybe Philip can answer this one. But how does one go from suffering, you know, when they're almost at failure on a leg press, to finding a deep sense of freedom and joy? I think that's where I I don't quite understand how you can make that transition. So maybe you can enlighten me. <laughs> well, I'll give it I'll give it my best shot. Um, <laughs> You know, I think it helps to understand that we have habituated to suffering in our daily lives. So we sit in our heads and organize our bodies and feel betrayed by our bodies and feel um, perhaps vain about our bodies. But, but, but there is this divide. We live in a divided state. So if you're living in your head... Um, and in a way that is shielding you from the intelligence of the body, from all that it feels and knows in the moment, then you are living in division. And division of the self is self-conflict. And we have habituated to self-conflict. And so then when we, when we go to, to do a leg press, we are deferring to this idea that you sit in the head and tell the body what to do and make it do that for its own good. And so I think that's why this workout is, is commonly understood to be a form of suffering, but it's not, it's, it's very short and it's for your own good. So, so you'll get through it. Um, it's like, it's like you're sitting in your head the way you would sit on a donkey and you're beating it with a switch telling it to go go faster go harder um that's our that's our relationship with the body and it's such a different thing to as andre says to drop into the body so you feel your wholeness and you feel your wholeness not as something contained in a silo you feel it as something that is held by the present and is seamlessly um, congruent with the present. And so, you know, when I sit in the leg press and I'm about to begin, I really deliberately drop my awareness right down, right down to my perineum. Um, and I can talk about that a bit later if you'd like. And from that place, I feel the machine and I come into relationship with it. And then when I begin to push, it's, it's the whole of my body's energy in harmony moving with the machine, not against it. And that's such a different thing from having my energy divided and cordoned off and, and in different compartments. And, and when that happens, um, I'm experiencing my wholeness. I'm experiencing my life. I'm experiencing this unique, never to be repeated moment. And it is, it is the most, in a way, the most intimate encounter with myself imaginable as I approach failure. And I am tapping into resources I didn't even know I had, not in a state of domination, but in a state of surrender. I am surrendering to what my body knows. I'm surrendering to what my body is capable of. And I am fully in the experience of that. I love that. And you know, I think I remember Andre. You mentioned to me that Philip has a significant performance on the leg press. Are we talking full stack for a very long period of time? A, a quite a long time under load. Is that correct? Yeah. So, just to let you know, several times our gym is in the office building on the ground floor, 
we had security guard walking in asking if everything was okay. <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> he goes for like up to 10 minutes with full stack. And, you know, decent range of motion, not just, you know, top, like, you know, you, you come down to close to 90 degree angle on the legs, right? So it's a good range of motion with full stack. And I feel I need to stop him because I don't want him to hurt himself. And he just goes and he gets into the state where it's loud, but because he allows to experience every sensation, every tweak of his body, of his muscle. So when you look at him, you know exactly what his body is going through right now. So it's, you know, a, a bit loud, but I cannot imagine, doesn't matter who you are doing full stack, good range of motion on the leg press for nine, 10 minutes. I, I, you have to be, you know, somewhere else, not in your head to do it. And so, Nine or ten minutes. I mean, that's yeah. unbelievable. And then he can go more. You cannot stop him because he's gonna hurt himself. <laughs> yeah, what really I mean, what happens, you know, as I drop down to the you know, I, I experience it as the core of my being, Lawrence. Um, that you know, coming back to the perineum, it is suddenly the source of my wholeness. It is the it is the still point through which my wholeness resonates, and there how to speak of this? There is an indifference to it. It it accepts everything, including this experience. So, so you know, with the leg press specifically, it, you know, after ten minutes, I'm I'm stopping because, frankly, my tolerance for pain has has hit a limit. It, but I could do more. I I, I don't get to the point where I couldn't do another one. Um, and it's and it's being sourced in the core in that way. That I mean, forgive me, guys, but that is like I don't know how you could do that. You know, nine or ten minutes. Like I think I don't know anyone that can do that. Even the strongest people I know, like that's just extremely long. I I, I forgive me, but I'm very skeptical. Right? I think that's fair enough, right? Because we'll you send know, you a video. Like, There's a video. Of it. If you can send me, a, if you send me a video, I will. And I, and it's it's proof i'll embed that on the blog post for this for sure um because that is i've not heard of that and um you know i trust obviously the the form is how you describe it andre but that is unheard of most people I are should, hitting muscular failure within two minutes on, on something like that easily i i, I should ahead. i should say I, I i have a i have a sore knee so i actually it's it's not the full stack from the beginning i work um for about two minutes to warm up and then i add um, 40 pounds, and then I work another um, two minutes and then add 40 pounds. Got it. Uh, no, no, I, I had 40 pounds at the beginning. I had 20 pounds, and then I'm at the full stack after four or five minutes, and then I then I go. But then when he had make, full stack, he does the whole 10 minutes. It's, it's, it's pure continuous work. And yeah. also a couple of times, uh, Philip mentioned to me that, you know, that just he had a crazy time and he was busy and, you know, he couldn't find his core, right? And he couldn't move that stack at all. You want to share your experience with him? Yeah, no, it's true. It was, it was, um, I forget, so much was going on and I put out so much energy. Um, I forget whether it was a facilitator's training I was running, but some something very intense. And I came in and sat down at, at the leg press. Um, and couldn't couldn't budge it because that that energy had been so depleted that that core energy uh, it was really instructive for me that's still yeah i mean that's still to, to be continuously under load regardless of the load for that amount of time is still um very challenging and impressive that you can withstand that um and that's and that's interesting thanks for sharing that Go on, Andre. He's Sorry. also 68 years old. Just yeah, there is that that small fact to. Uh, <laughs> you, should, you should see his legs. Add. Ask him about <laughs> his uh, bike uh, ride from London, UK to Japan when he was 17. <laughs> yeah, I was going to come on to that. Tell us about this, Philip. So at the age of 17, you flew to London in the UK, you bought a bicycle, and then you cycled to Japan, as you do, right? So as tell us do. about that. <laughs> oh, it was like it's back to this cultural thing, Lawrence, that as a, as a teenager, I felt imprisoned in the assumptions and ways of seeing and ways of 
talking about reality. And I say, hey, you know, I, I had the impression that the adults in my world were living out this fantasy and, and, and inviting me to join it and you'll do well. And, and, you know, my being rebelled and I, I fought against it to the best of my ability. And then I realized the only way I could preserve what mattered most in my life was to leave that incubator in which I'd, I'd been raised. And uh, so I went to London and, as you say, bought a bicycle and cycled through Europe and the Middle East and India and Japan. Um, you're so open and exposed on a bike. You're, you're part of the scenery. It's not like being in a car where, where you're enclosed. And I passed through so many ways, different cultures, of understanding what it means to be human. And every one of them was luminous, and every one of them was limited. And I didn't once experience culture shock until two years later I returned home and suddenly here I was in this environment that was so deeply familiar to me and yet bizarre and arbitrary. And, and so I'd come home with the ability to raise questions where I most needed to. And I think the most difficult thing in the world to question is something that you've habituated to, you've normalized to from an age when you were unable even to formulate a question. I'm just curious, how did you, how did you like afford to do that? I mean, how did you, I mean, not trying to dig into sort of personal information here about like whether you had, I don't know, a load of money to do that, but I'm just curious, like, how did you, yeah, how did you afford to do that? Like when you were traveling the whole way, I mean, were you working along the way or? Um, I worked in Japan. I ran out of money okay. by the time I got to Japan and I slept outside everywhere. And there was this, you know, there was this moment every, every day, um, you know, the sun kind of arcs down towards the, the Western horizon and it's time to find a place to sleep. And I think some of our sensitivities are called forth when our life depends on it. And there was a sense every single night of being guided to a place where I could safely spend the night. It was like I was being taken by the hand. Um, and uh, I've never, uh, you know, I've never lost that sense of being guided in my life. It's, it's, a, it's a larger metaphor for me. So, you know, I slept outside all the way. I cooked my own dinner. Um, I had a little, you know, um, stove that I, with a blue flame, so does a, a propane or butane stove, I forget which, but a blue flame so it couldn't be seen. You know, so many of these stoves go bright yellow and, I, you know, it was important for me that I could just be there without, without signaling my presence to anyone. And, and I, you know, every night I slept safely. Um, there was one night in Italy where I woke up because a rat was sort of nibbling at my finger. Um, but, you know, these, these things happen and it ran away and I slept peacefully the rest of the night. And that was the start of your journey, right, into this kind of exploration of mindfulness. And you've obviously had quite a colorful career. Um, and I'm sure I think people could find out all about that on your website, can't they? Um, yeah, I think so. I don't know that I yeah. talk much about myself. I mean, I, I should say that in that journey back to my body, theater played a yeah. really primary role. I've been an actor all my life, and every exercise an actor is is encouraged to to undertake ultimately is just another way of being present. Can you be present to this? Can you be present to this situation? Can we, you be present when there are 400 people watching you? And, and, you know, we speak of an actor's presence and what we're speaking of is 
the ability of that actor to remain in a state of wholeness, feeling everything. And you're, I mean, you're feeling, you know, this imaginary world that you're embedded in, the, the other people in that world. You're also feeling the audience. You're also feeling the lights. You're like, you're feeling everything. So when an actor has presence, every gesture, everything the actor says is, is arising out of the currents of the present. And so the actor is helping the audience to be present. And I think that's, that's the real gift, the real offering that theater has to make to people. Yeah. Yeah, put, it enables the audience to put themselves in the shoes of the protagonist or the actors in question, right? Or part, yeah, and, part of the and appeal, to, right? And to feel their vivid yeah. life in this moment in relationship to, to what is happening on the stage. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I tried to put myself in James Bond shoes the other day during the latest, I uh, can't really even remember the title. Is it No Time to Die? I think no was the title die. of it. Yeah. I'm so so out already. seeing it. <laughs> Have you not seen it yet? Have you seen it? Andre? No, I didn't realize it was out already. It it, yeah, it yeah. opens in Canada today, I believe. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because you guys have been obviously under more restrictions, right? So cinemas were closed, theaters. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely worth seeing. I enjoyed it. Not enough action for me personally, but still good, all the same. Sorry, I won't say any more. Um so I just want to actually get back to talking about, uh, well, obviously we are talking about mindfulness here, but talk about it um, with respect to the workout. I'd love to hear you, Andre, talk about the experiences you've had with Philip and uh, your mutual friend in terms of learning about you know, the embodied present process and learning more about mindfulness. How has that changed your training? And has it enabled you to train harder and um, tolerate discomfort better? Because I because I think this is really interesting. Because I think a lot of our colleagues and also just the fitness and high intensity training enthusiasts out there might be inter interested. Sorry, to learn how they can be better at tolerating that discomfort, so they can really push themselves further. So I'd love to know how does how has it man manifested itself for you in your workouts? Yeah, it's a very good question, Lawrence. Um... And by the way, uh, Philip goes into details in chapter six in our book, step by step, how to experience what he's describing, you know, on the leg press. From practical application, somebody who trains people and see people every day, um, you know, it's tricky. I, as Philip mentioned, I took several of his uh, weekend workshops and completed a year-long facilitator training. And I remember during the second day of the facilitator training, I, I got it. Like I took several weekend workshops. They felt, felt great, but it took me a while to really experience that being Philip is talking about. And I remember thinking, oh, this feels great. You know, you're doing this practice in, in the workshop and then, you know, you're sitting with with a group of people you have nothing in common with different age demographics so you're very self-conscious like you know what i'm doing here and then do the practice and all of a sudden you look into somebody's eyes and you've known that person your entire life you have this such a deep sense of intimacy and connection impossible to describe un un until you try it and his books he mentioned he has a couple books and i really had had, had hard time reading those because, you know, he writes from this perspective of from experience of life from the core and so on. So intellectually, you kind of get it, but it's not an easy book to, to conceptualize until you experienced it, experienced it. And I remember driving home from that facilitator training and listening to his audio book. Finally, I understood every word he was talking about. Like it became, wow, this is what, it, you know, so... But only, I only got it after I experienced that work. And I remember coming back home and realizing, wow, this is so, so powerful. Because, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we have this one shot at our life. And by not experiencing your body the way you're being, I realized that we're missing such a big undiscovered 
hidden aspect of our human experience. It's there, but we don't know it's there. Maybe we experienced it without thinking about it when we were children. We were, you know, attuned to being present. And, and it was such a gift to experience that and realize there is more to life than I ever knew of. And then I kind of, to me, it was, wow, I'm, I'm hooked for life. Like, it doesn't matter how much money you can give me and tell me, don't do this work. I will never take any amount of money can substitute that, that human experience, which I value so much. In terms of practical application, you know, in the gym, what I, you do find that unless you are, as a coach, you're present, you can really coach your client for that experience. So one, you have to sort of be in that state yourself. And then when you are in that state, you can coach client. And the simplest way to think of it is shift their awareness just to focus on the experience. You know, think of how each inch of the range of motion brings slightly different sensation in your muscle, in your body. Just let coach them just what you're feeling right now. Just feel those muscles. And what about now? Feel it, feel it. And the more you focus on the experience itself, the more you get out of your head, the more you kind of get that embodied practice. And it takes you somewhere. And I remember a few clients after those sessions would come to me, you took me somewhere I never, I never been before. Like it's a very unique experience. And it's, you know, as a, as a human being, but also as a business owner, when people leave your place and they had this unique experience, you know, they're going to come back. So it's also a super powerful retention tool for, for us because you, you give people experience they just wouldn't get anywhere else. And not every client uses those mindful strength training cues. And frankly, lately with the COVID, I haven't been doing a very good job myself practicing that work. Um, but what I do practice, that's kind of what I do. I just focus on the experience. Um, you, you can get into that state where the more you focus on the experience, your muscles are burning and they're failing, but they're still moving. They're still going, right? And then, so you know you're going longer than otherwise. And then when you're done, you know, taking five, 10 seconds just to feel that spaciousness, you know, when you kind of do leg press and you sit and there's this like relief. And when people do, they usually sigh, the body, the body sighs. And, I realized the preciousness of that moment because when the body does it, that, that sigh and then there's release, all you have to do, just feel it. And there is this emptiness that right? you, and to me, that's probably the best part of the training is that emptiness in the end, you know, for a few seconds. And then you move and repeat. Not saying I'm doing it with every client, not saying I'm doing it all the time. You know, lately I have these training bodies. We come on Sundays, we train each other, and we 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 silly. You know, we using bad words. We like we just having fun. So there's not much mindfulness in our workouts, <laughs> but uh, but it is what it is. But it is there for those who want to learn how to do it and help the client to experience this unique uh, experience. I'd love to hear more about the cues. So for those that are open to it and those that where you find it productive, what are the kinds of cues you were using specifically? to help people be more mindful and get yeah. more out of their workouts? Um, again, there are more details here in the book. Okay. From easier way and the fastest way, in my opinion, to experience presence, it just coach and client by allowing them to focus their their uh, awareness on the experience, right? So just, you know, put somebody in the machine and just let's start the movement and coach them to make it about the experience. The focus should be on the experience, not how many reps they're going to do, not hitting, you know, your goal, whatever, because all those you in your head. When you focus on the experience and you just, you know, like how this feels right now, this inch, this position and this inch and allow the awareness sort of to drop in the body and you can visualize sort of, you know, you're, I don't know, you're surfing, right? And the waves are growing and they're changing. And you're like, your awareness is that, that surfer on top of it. 
you're not trying to manage those experiences. You just try to surrender to them and experience and feel them and be present to them. So the cues kind of come naturally where, you know, whatever comes, the right cue, you tell people just, just feel everything. Don't, don't think about too far ahead, just moment by moment, inch by inch. And you know they got it when it's very intimate experience, very intimate. You know, the other part in your life, you might relate to this experience when we have an intercourse, right? Because you're in your body and you're just feeling this moment. Similar here. And in fact, when somebody lets go, it even sounds, you know, that intimate. So, but... <laughs> It's not in a sexual way. It's in a way of that liberation. So when I look at the client and even in the face, they're not, you know, you can tell, like, just let the face be expression of your legs if you're doing leg press, right? So you become one. Every cell in your body experiencing your legs or whatever shows up. And then there is this, when client gets it and that's it, I, I feel it like there's a wave hits me. I feel their sensation and we kind of become one, right? And we live in, we feel in this experience of the client. So uh, I don't know if I answer your question directly, but no, generally do. that's the direction. Yeah, I, I think that one of the gems I took from your saying, which is don't necessarily focus on the end goal, just focus on the actual experience in the moment. And in the book, you talk about prioritizing feeling the targeted muscle, which I think is related to this, right? It's saying to the person moment by moment during the set, okay, can you, cause like for instance, in a leg press, you know, you're more likely to obviously feel the glutes and the quads burning in that bottom position. So it's perhaps talking to the client, telling them to focus on those, or, or maybe not too many muscle groups, but maybe say to just focus on the glutes, focus on pushing with the glutes and feel, you know, feel the sensation in there. And, and obviously that's something that I think most, I think probably most people might be afraid of or not enjoy, but maybe there's by reframing it and saying, you know, embrace that surrender to it. Maybe people are going to tolerate it better. And I've seen this, this has been talked about before about people focusing on the target muscle during an exercise. Like if they're on a medex chest press you know focus on contracting the chest and and so this is this is something that's definitely um seems to work and i use it i always say to clients to focus on a target muscle um and you know i'm thinking about it now i'm just thinking whether that really in my experience proves performance I'm not saying that's exactly what you're doing with the queuing maybe there's more to it with the queuing i'm sure you you elaborate it in the book but um no it's something that it's something that i do um and maybe that does help with activation or recruitment of those muscles and overall performance um anything else to say on that in terms of cueing yeah philip maybe you yeah, can go uh, ahead yeah well yeah um there's a there's a there's a you know it's this dichotomy of being in the head or in your wholeness um and 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 just it it, it i think it's helpful to speak to the difference in those experiences, when you're in your head, you are susceptible to telling stories. So, oh, I can do one more. Oh, I got to push harder. Um, oh, I, I, I think this is failure. Um, and all that, all that chatter is going on. And when you're in your body, like there's, there's, there's none of that. And I think, I think to understand presence in our culture. Um, is difficult because we bring to it the bias of our culture. And to me, the, the bias of our culture at its heart is that everything needs to be organized. So we organize our thoughts, we organize our bodies, we, we organize our emotions, for goodness sakes, we organize our faces, you know, when we meet someone, we organize our relationships and our days and our careers. And, it, you know, there's a place for organization. But what happens is we then understand being present as a matter of organizing ourselves into that state of presence, which actually thwarts the experience of being present. For me, that experience is really the experience of feeling yourself being organized by the present. You can't be informed by the present. You can't be congruent with it. If, if you are not in some way being organized by it. And so then, you know, for me, I shift 
um, instead of, I wouldn't, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't say to anyone, just be present because they're going to internalize that as, okay, g- g- give me a sec. Let me, let me get organized. Um, so I see an equivalence between presence and receptivity. If I'm fully receptive to you, I'm fully present to you. If I'm fully present to you, I'm fully receptive to you. So to say to someone, just receive, lands very differently. And then to go into the leg press, the chest press, whatever it is, in a state of full receptivity. So you're not organizing the experience. You're not storytelling. You are receiving every sensation of the moment. And and that requires a certain security of being to just receive because otherwise it can be overwhelming and and that security of being is for me is is what happens what you find when you drop down through the body and come to rest so your awareness comes to rest on the pelvic floor i i feel and experience the pelvic floor as the ground of my being. So when I come home to myself, it's to the pelvic floor I return. When when I seek to feel my way into my deepest truth, it's it's to the pelvic floor I, I come to rest. Um, and so to abide within that security of your being makes possible the receptivity of this otherwise overwhelming experience. That was very profound. <laughs> that was very useful. Now I, I really enjoyed that, and I, I, I'm definitely going to be re-listening to that. I hopefully, re-listen to the whole episode, but definitely that passage. Um, there's something I want to uh, help. If, see if you can help me reconcile. It's a bit of a devil's advocate comment, um, but I guess a lot of people in our industry will talk about you know having an aggressive mentality, an aggressive mindset uh, going into an exercise. So. What you often see happening in a high intensity training, and Andre will be very familiar with this, is certain individuals, when they get to the end of a set, they start to shake their head. They say, I can't, I'm, I'm done. I can't, you know, they're, they're not even finished and their body language is already kind of surrendering, but in, a, in, in not in a productive sense, in like, a, I don't believe in myself. I can't do this. I'm going to give up early sense. And you know, I, I always encourage people not to do that. I say, I say, you'll actually, even though, yeah, you're quite right. You probably are almost at failure. You will get more out of yourself just through changing your body language and just focusing on fatigue in the target muscle as much as possible and diverting the energy there. And, um, you know, others might just to add to that. Others might say when you're almost at failure, rather than kind of, again, kind of going into this kind of surrendering posture, you should instead divert the energy into it, like being a predator and really almost like rather than, so, so for example, you'll see some people shaking the head and, you know, kind of being a bit, um, a bit defeated. Whereas, um, my good friend, Doug Holland is known to sort of swear very aggressively and talk, talk, talk about, about the exercise, like, like they're an assailant, like they're his adversaries, like, come on, is that all you got? kind of you know approach and um i think there's maybe a place for that but in my mind that conflicts with what you're saying about this sort of surrendering to it so how might you reconcile aggressive mentality versus what you just spoke about and do you think that 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 your approach is superior and if so why uh well i have experiences both approaches and i love them both uh philip we want to say go first and then i'll uh, share my two cents yeah, I, 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 I don't see much difference between them until the aggressive approach takes you into division. So, so what I mean by that is when I'm dropped down to my core, I am, I am answering a necessity. And I, you know, I don't think you can experience true failure unless you in some sense refuse to fail so so there is you know as i drop down in my core there's this sense of i am i am alive i i will answer this 
necessity with the whole of my being. And as Andre said, you know, several times the security guards from way down the lobby outside the gym have come by to make sure no one's dying. So, so you know, it's it's not that I'm I'm in this gentle, lovely state, but 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 I'm I'm in play between this this roar of my being that that is summoned forth and this bliss of gentleness. I mean, to be at the extremity of failure in a leg press and find how gently can I move this is extraordinary. I mean, it's an extraordinary experience. And I trust the ease of it when I'm truly in my core, you know, even after eight or nine minutes on the leg press, it's still so easy to push it. Um, and, and in that ease is such a simplicity. And it's the simplicity that comes with wholeness or harmony. And if you are assuming that you have to be aggressive with this exercise, there is the likelihood that you will turn that aggression against yourself. Yeah, that's very true. I, I actually probably misinterpreted because I remember Andre saying that you, you're you very loud at the end of a set and some people are, right? And, and that's the way you manifest your um, yourself in, in your exercise and how you probably get the most out of yourself, right? Well, is, I, is, it's this thing go ahead. of yeah. no part of my being is censored. All right. Because if I, full if, I devote, <laughs> if I devote energy to suppressing or censoring my being, that energy isn't available for the for the exercise. Are we talking about, is it like a roar? Is it a scream? Maybe, Andre, you can... Uh... <laughs> well, we'll upload the video, but he is, he is loud. You know, imagine how <laughs> legs would feel uh, on the leg press after a you know, few minutes. And I'd probably be crying. You, when point. you watch him, you know exactly what he's feeling. There is no censorship. There is no supervision. He's just being in the moment and you're experiencing and you kind of feel it. And it, it's a joy. It's a joy watching it. Even though on outside, for those who are not familiar with it, it might look scary. But once you know what, he, like, it's, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Do you have stairs leading up to your facility, Andre? Huh? Do you have stairs leading up to your facility or are you ground level? Uh, no, we pretty much ground floor. All right, because it would be just funny to watch Philip walk down the stairs after that. <laughs> no, he, he, after he's walk. done with the leg press, he can walk. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't. I can't. I, 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 I can't walk. Yeah? I, I, need, I, I need a couple of minutes. Oh, of course. Yeah, no, I totally understand that. Now, that was really insightful. Andre, do you have anything else you want to say? Because you said there you, you love both aggressive mentality. Although yeah. they're not, obviously, they're not mutually exclusive, as Philip just yeah. very articulately explained. So, but please share your thoughts on that as well. Well, I believe there is science um, suggesting that your state of mind will dictate what kind of hormones you're going to produce, what kind of neurochemicals you're going to release. And being, you know, what you're talking about, being aggressive versus being submissive, probably will have very different response, uh, neurochemical response, physiological response in your body. Mm. And, you know, I'm training with some of my bodies who are frankly not familiar so much with, you know, Philip's work and, you know, that's all you got. That's kind of what we do. It's just, it's fun, right? <laughs> um, so I understand, I understand what, you, what you're saying. Um, but I think I don't want to say too much more because, what Philip just described, it, it's so, you know, so clear and so potent. So we just probably, I would rather keep it there. If yeah, I, 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 res just, I respect that. Go if ahead. I yeah. could, if I could just add, when, when someone's saying to you, is that all you've got? To, they are appealing to your core, right? They're bringing you back to that ground of truth. Um, so that's, that's where, you know, they, they, they become the same thing. In, in in a way it's just it's just it's just if you're turning that aggression on yourself you are out of harmony how does one turn that aggression to themselves um we here's here's an interesting thing lawrence um when you're present your awareness dilates into the present your your awareness is um, a field. 
that's being in in a sense when we get into doing mode our awareness tends to contract and then you feel alone and when you feel alone you have to supervise yourself there is no access to guidance or support of you know there the 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 stillness of the present is inviolate you know as you open to the to the present there is this underlying stillness that is always there and in in the middle of a of a set i'm dilating feeling that resting in it and finding strength from it so to more and more contract into your aloneness is to become more and more susceptible to um self bullying to to um all that stuff that happens with division now with someone saying to you is that all you've got you are in relationship with that other person with the machine so it it helps it's not it's not um it's not a it's not that contracted state of aloneness in which we can only goad ourselves on um from that as andre says that supervisor in the head yeah thank you that was really well said i appreciate that okay so i'm i'm probably going to leave some of the other well we might touch on some more of the book here actually but obviously uh there's lots that we haven't touched on and and i encourage the the listeners to to go and buy a copy and we'll talk about where they can get that in a moment um just a couple of things i want to touch on before we wrap up here um you say he about um you make a claim in the book talking about how the understanding of exercise lags 50 years behind the current research and um yeah we'd love to hear you elaborate on that again give us a little bit of insight in the book um for the for the audience here on that on that particular point and i think andre if you want to start with that and then philip can chime in as well i'll i'll pass it on to philip uh oh, that part of free, the yeah. book he said he did such an amazing job diving into the history and the I mean, I, I date it to 1968 when the book Aerobics came out, and it was written by Kenneth Cooper, who was a medical doctor and and a recognized authority in fitness. I mean, he worked with the astronauts at NASA, he, and and he coined the word aerobics. Didn't exist until he the book came out, and. and um his book his his book sold 30 million copies to give you an idea so so this book presented an idea of fitness that said what exercise does is it conditions the heart and the lungs that's its primary job um you can do that walking swimming cycling running and and the you know he he had a system of points that said how many points you earned walking this far or running for this long and the more points you gained in a week the more fit you were going to be and he discouraged strength training because he felt that muscle would put a uh, more load on the heart every one of those contentions has been disproved um and just to just to give you some idea you know to this day we think when we go for a run we're conditioning the heart and the lungs well they did this experiment that you may know about where where they had um uh people in a study who who uh, you know their their vo2 max was tested before the study on a stationary bike and then they exercised three or four times a week for four weeks using one leg using only the same leg through the whole thing and at the end of the uh the program their vo2 max was again tested and it had improved i think 23% with that leg then they were tested with the other leg and there was virtually no improvement so yes the body had adapted but the adaptations weren't in the heart and the lungs the adaptations were in the muscles and you know muscle has gone from or our our understanding of muscle has gone from saying well the primary function of muscle is to move us around 
And we now understand that muscle has two primary functions, to move us around and to generate myokines, hormones that go through the body and affect every tissue, every organ. These are signaling molecules um, that promote health through the body. And you go to somebody on the street and do you know what myokines are? And it's, it's like never heard of it. Do you know what sarcopenia is? Never heard of it. And there's a, there's a large body of evidence that suggests that the underlying commonality to all of our chronic diseases is sarcopenia, is the wasting of muscle with age. It's associated with every modern disease of civilization that, that afflicts us. And, and so that, you know, that 50 year lag, we are, we are married to this concept that exercise means aerobic fitness. Fitness means um, aerobic performance. Even though Kenneth Cooper, who wrote the book, has moved on and he now recommends strength training, but it's like this, this paradigm took hold of us and he's, he's on the fringe saying, no, no, I've changed my mind. It's, it's different. I mean, he's very open to research, but no, we, we don't even hear it. We're stuck um, in this idea that, that, that the conditioning that exercise achieves is the conditioning of the heart and the lungs. And muscles aren't really that important. It turns out muscles are the foundation of our metabolic health. Beyond your experience of Andre and, and learning about all this stuff, though, do you see people being a little bit more aware of this? Because I am seeing, before they even speak to me, I see clients who seem to have a little bit more awareness around the importance of strength and muscle mass. Um, they, they just seem a little bit more prepared than they were, say, 10 years ago. Are you seeing that, Andre, in the studio, um, or, or is that just my own experience? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely uh, more and more in New York Times. We see more and more articles making the right. popular culture right. talking about the importance. got Brad's about article about saving time with training. That was quite yeah. big. Um, yeah. And, you know, because people who come to us, they clearly see some benefits in strength training, so they're more or less prepared. Uh, and I would say, yes, there is. We are definitely on the cusp of this, you know, probably transition, uh, how many years is going to take to, to become a knowledge we'll see. Um, but, you know, generally general public probably by and large still probably not aware of it, but, you know, people come to us slowly, you know, slowly getting educated and starting to appreciate the importance of, uh, of muscle and strength training. And it's, such a joy taking somebody through the intro session, you know, of the right demographics, because you share with people something they never heard of and they experienced something they never experienced. And yet they thought they knew everything about exercise. It's it, like, it, it's fun. It's really rewarding. And you're right. It's, it's great when you see that, that twinkle in someone's eye where they're kind of like, wow, I finally found it. I'm, it I, makes total I have, sense. I have, like, I have arrived. <laughs> yeah. They look like, is this a franchise? Because it makes total sense. You know, this should be everywhere. Like, yeah. 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 But I, I think it's also important to say, and just very quickly, because I want to certainly ask some more things of both of you, but, um, you know, we, I think some of us in this industry take it for granted that people are going to experience it and they're just going to know. It's like, no, no, no. I think we still have to take the education piece very seriously. And we do that in the initial consultation. You know, we listen to the client, we listen to what they care about, what is meaningful to them, what are their problems. And then we talk succinctly and specifically about how our approach is going to help them solve those and just start there. Don't overwhelm people with my accounts or the rest of it, because they're just going to have a system meltdown and um, they're not going to, it's not going to work very well. But the point is then once they become a client, it's doing that weekly teaching focus. It's drip feeding these really important facts to people. So you're kind of you're kind of reprogramming their software, right? Just like you talked about there, Philip, about you know what what it really means to have to stimulate cardiovascular improvement and how it's in the periphery and in the muscle and not necessarily central. And it's 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 that that's our teaching focus right there. And it's breaking that down into thirty seconds, saying it to every client that week, and then you move on to the next. And that's what we do. And I think it's so important and overlooked. I think we. We just take it for granted that the stimulus is going to educate them in and of itself. And it will to an extent with some individuals, but some people, I remember I had this one guy who's been training with me for a while. And he said to me the other day, 
oh, you know, a, uh, a a senior person couldn't do this at this level of intensity because they're, they're likely to get injured. And I'm thinking, I've not done my job properly here because you still think there's risk of being injured, even though you're using no momentum and a relatively slow speed of movement. That's the whole point. You can lift heavy and it's safe. And it just reminded me that we can never kind of rest on our laurels. We have to be very diligent about or judicious, sorry, about, you know, um, making sure that we're educating people. So anyway, anyway, I'll get off my, my, uh, my soapbox now <laughs> on that. But um, the last thing I wanted to ask you about quickly, and uh, Philip, maybe you're, maybe this is a, the, the, the part you wrote about in the book, uh, but love to hear about the strength training as it relates to activating longevity genes. I think this is something that some of our industry knows about, but it's just so important to reiterate. So do you want to talk about the longevity gene side of things? Yeah, um, I mean that's. Uh, I'm going to defer to Andre because he's sure. he's so much more um, deeply steeped in that field than I. Um, so, Lawrence, have you heard of uh, Dr. David St. Clair from Harvard? He's kind yes. of big guy of longevity guy yeah, the last couple of years. So, around, I, yeah. I um, after listening to his first interview on Joe Rogan, must be two, maybe three years ago, or so. I, like, I became such a fan of his research and I was one of the first to get his book. And what we know today and what he talks about, you know, there is essentially nine hallmarks of aging. But what he talks about that there is really three major upstream pathways that affect all those hallmarks, which are sirtuins. There are seven of us. Those are the longevity genes, uh, AMPK and mTOR. And when we activate those sirtuin genes, we essentially trigger DNA repair, and that promotes longevity, at least in multiple animal studies. And there is this one to seven, seven different, seven different sirtuin genes. And I've seen paper recently, well, say recently, a few months ago, that showed that strength training directly activates three of those sirtuin genes, sirt one, sirt three, and sirt six, I believe. So just alone showed us that those longevity genes we know that are responsible for our you know health span and longevity and strength training alone directly activates three of those genes you know we can talk about nads and how when sirtuins need those nads to get activated uh and you listen to sinclair he's saying there's you know naturally a couple of ways to raise our own nads uh one of them is intensive exercise kind of we do it another way through calorie caloric restriction so it's very exciting because the latest research supports what you know Doug McGuff was saying about how this is probably the most underrated you know longevity intervention uh, in the world. And now more and more science comes and shows like it is it does affect our longevity yeah. on the genetic on the epigenetic level. I might, Philip, you, uh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, do, I might just add to that because because David Sinclair talks about this primordial survival circuit that that existed in the earliest life forms on earth and exists in every life form today and the survival circuit basically in times of stress it shuts down reproduction and concentrates on repair and that's that's absolutely essential for longevity because because without without that period of restoration and repair you know the damage accumulates and accumulates and you know i'm sure people know about autophagy where where your body um under intermittent fasting or longer fasting starts to um eat the damaged parts of the cells and the damaged parts of this dna um, but he, David Sinclair talks about hormesis, which is, which is a positive stress, a positive shock to the body that triggers the survival circuit and so promotes longevity. And as Andre said, that, that hormesis, that shock can come in terms of hunger, can come in terms of extreme heat or cold, and intense exercise. So to me, that the intensity um, that uh, a hit session uh, provokes in the body is is activating this uh, 
rush uh, uh, within the body to repair and restore and promote longevity. Well said. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time today to be on the show. I'm just aware that Andre needs to uh, put someone through some mindful strength training to failure. <laughs> but um just one last uh opportunity to say uh for everyone listening please go check out deep fitness the mindful science-based strength training method to transform your well-being in just 30 minutes a week and guys where can they buy the book it's it's distributed by penguin random house okay so it 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 should be available literally everywhere at your also amazon store. usual yeah 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 okay exactly. bookstores everywhere Great. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Great job, guys. Very impressive. And you said it's ebook format as well. Where can they get the ebook exactly? Uh, same thing, Amazon. Oh, it's um, Kindle, right? Or, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. And, and audio book as well. Yeah. Audible. Yeah. Great. All right. That's great because everyone like, has the different uh, preferred formats, don't they? And um, what's the best way to find out more about both of you, starting with yourself, Philip? Um, I have a website, um, embodiedpresent.com. And, um, you know, it's got, uh, it's got blogs to read. It's got lots of information. I've got a European tour that's starting in mid November where I'm in, uh, Berlin and England and the Netherlands, um, and lots of other info. Cool. Thank you very much. And Andre yourself. Yeah. As of me, it's our company's website, new element training.com. And I should also mention that there's over 30 different exercises in the book, you know, half of them about half machine base, half body weight, with very detailed description, all the cues. Uh, but we also recorded videos of all those exercises, and they also will be available uh, through our website, through the resource page uh, for somebody who, you know, need to watch a little video, watching us uh, doing this kind of training they'll have access to those resources as well through your website, newelementtraining.com. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for repeating the URL. That's great. Thank you both. And for everyone listening, to find the blog post for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com. Search for episode 335. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. Mm-hmm.